home from the sea. For the sailor, there can be no more welcome sight than the familiar sea walls of the harbour which says home. The ancient civilizations of the Western world drew their sustenance as well as their inspiration from the mighty inland sea known to the Romans as the Mare Nostrum. These fishermen are the modern heirs to a venerable line. Merchants, wanderers, sometimes smugglers, always adventurers, casting their nets wherever the shoals churn the seas. The Mediterranean still serves the nations which inhabit its shores as both highway and living larder. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Luard in the port of Tangier by the Pillars of Hercules. Behind me, the fishing fleet fishes both sides of the straits, into the Mediterranean and into the Atlantic. The fish is landed here, and later on we're going to follow a fisherman's wife home and see how she cooks the stew. The arrival of the fishing fleet is big business in ports like this. The wholesalers take the bulk of the catch to supply the inland cities, and these days the international markets as well shipping the more valuable fish to those who will pay the highest price. Haggling is the name of the game. The cheaper fish finds a ready market locally, traded for a few dirham to housewives. Some of the sellers only have a handful of their own gathering. Others trade for their families. I have a fancy for fresh sardines. After many years as a Mediterranean housewife, I will only buy them on the morning they're caught. When they're fresh, they're absolutely delicious. <laughs> Fatima comes from a family of fishermen. She knows what's good. And this sea bream is the best fish for the tagine, a fisherman's stew which takes its name from the pot in which it's cooked. The design of this earthenware casserole goes back to prehistoric times. It's the universal cooking pot all round the Mediterranean. The dish has to be seasoned, rubbed with garlic and salt, and subjected to long, slow tempering. With all one-pot meals, the cooking vessel dictates the finished dish. First, a layer of tomatoes for their juice, then sliced potatoes. To season, charmula, an aromatic paste of garlic pounded with salt, cumin, fresh coriander and parsley, moistened with lemon juice. The fish is chopped into thick steaks to allow the heat to penetrate the flesh. The head goes in too. The cheeks are a delicacy. This is a family meal meant to taste good. To a fisherman, even the heads look beautiful. Olive oil, essential to the cooking of the Mediterranean, is used to enrich the stew, mixed generously with paprika and cumin, which will thicken the juices a little. Trickled over, it forms a natural sauce. No water is necessary, just an upturned plate to cover so that the aromatic steam does not escape. The brazier gives a steady even heat, cooking the food evenly and gently. If Fatima is cooking over charcoal on an open flame, she prefers to cook and serve the meal up here on the open roof. Now it's been cooking very gently for about 35, 40 minutes and it still looks absolutely beautiful and fresh. Lovely fish, tomatoes, garlic, parsley, olive oil, paprika, potatoes on the bottom and they're all tender and lovely. And we have a feast to go with it. We have olives and we have fruit and now we're all going to enjoy it together.
Only one person apportions and distributes the bread. Traditionally, this is to avoid a quarrel. It's expected, considered the height of good manners, to eat out of the serving dish with your fingers. Only the right hand must be used, the left being reserved for less exalted purposes. This from the, the, the mountain. My mother did bring it from the mountains. Mm. This one. It's delicious. Mm. Mm. Down below in the marketplace, the olives are indeed delicious. The souk has its own olive market, stalls which sell nothing but pickled olives. Spicings are many and various. I have my own favorites. When I lived with my growing family across the straits in southern Spain, we pickled our own olives every year. I like the black ripe ones prepared with chili, spicy and hot, my favorite. The fruit is sold fresh in season, but it's inedible unless leached of its bitterness in fresh water, many changes, and then pickling with salt. Mature olives are black, their flesh sweetened by the sun, the stage at which they are normally pressed for oil. Although in Morocco, the Berbers make an excellent home-milled oil from unripened green fruit. Picking is best done by hand. It's a labor-intensive harvest, providing employment for whole families who follow the work, moving higher up into the hills as the season progresses. The pickers get paid by the crate, piecework. Time for a break for the midday meal, and the bread's homemade. The food is simple, healthy, and wholesome. For dipping, a spicy stew made with chickpeas and vegetables, enriched with olive oil and paprika. Everyone looks forward to this moment. The bread is used as a sop, a kind of edible spoon and fork. And it's bad manners to break off and dip in too large a piece at a time. A glass of cool mint tea to refresh the palate. It tastes just as good out of a jar. In Moroccan homes, bread is still made daily, sometimes twice or three times a day. Sadia has agreed to show me how she does it. A mother of three, she lives with her parents and works part-time, coming home at midday to prepare the daily bread. The quantity of flour is dictated by the size of the family. For Sadia's family of six, she takes about four pounds, two kilos of flour, some salt, a good handful of crumbled fresh yeast, enough warm water to make a soft dish dough, about two pints. Sadia pours it over her hand to make sure it's not too hot. If it scalds her hand, it'll scald the little yeast cells too. The warmth of the hand in the dough starts the yeast working straight away. The earthenware pan is called a gassar, kept only for bread making. It comes from the same school of pottery as the tagine, purpose designed, as ancient as civilization itself. This stretches the gluten. Nice work. Soothing, nothing like it. You can see it's beginning to rise already. Nice little plump cushions, very sensual. The idea is three loaves of exactly the right size to be divided into quarters for dipping. The cloth is absolutely spotless. Moroccan housewives are very conscious of cleanliness. Implements are simple, possessions few, but everything is spotless. The loaves are left for half an hour to rise, then it's off to the community baker, a job for Sadia's son, Mustafa. He's never in a hurry, always takes a long time to get to the bakery, time enough for the dough to rise some more. All 
day long, a constant stream of children arrive with their family's daily bread. How can the baker tell whose is which? Simple. The marks on the top. As individual to each family as the marks on a rancher's cattle. Doesn't it look lovely? Imagine the scent of it, the chewiness of the dough, the deliciously toasty flavor of the crust. Down they go on the cloth in which the loaves were wrapped. Another guarantee that you get the right ones back. grain has another use. These hands belong to ladies who are skilled in the difficult art of making couscous. You might call this very primitive pasta. Fine hard grains of semolina are rolled in flour so the grains cook separately. Rolled again into even smaller pellets. Now we have the couscous itself, ready to be dried and stored. This couscous has been soaked. It serves about six people. It's important the prepared grains absorb as much moisture as possible. The first layer in the pot is lamb. Baya pre-soaks her chickpeas and keeps them in the freezer, a good trick which saves time. Now the vegetables, chunked. This is a family meal. Potatoes, carrots, onions, tomatoes, and thickly sliced cabbage. And a sprinkling of raisins for sweetness. A good coloring of turmeric or pounded saffron, quite often both. Yellow is considered a happy color, bringing joy to a meal and encouraging good fellowship in those who share it. Salt and pepper. Chamula, chopped coriander and parsley, pounded up with garlic, salt and cumin. Olive oil to enrich the stew. Enough water to cover generously. The couscous grains have absorbed enough water and must be worked to get rid of lumps. It's very important to get all of them out. The stew is in the bottom layer with the couscous in the steamer above. Uncover as soon as the stew comes to the boil and cook for 30 minutes. Couscous is not only the Moroccan equivalent of Sunday dinner, but in a grander version, it's the dish served at the end of a caliph's banquet after the roast meats, making doubly sure that all the guests have eaten their fill. <laughs> Bismillah. Bismillah. In the name of God. Bismillah. All right hands into the dish. This time we can use the whole hand to roll the couscous into a neat little ball. And uh, not so neat as it happens. This takes practice. To your health. This gloriously tiled gateway leads into the Medina, reminding everyone who passes through that they're entering a prosperous merchant city, orderly and civilized, where the rule of law prevails. To underline the point, the arch is inscribed with holy sayings from the Quran. The intricate patternings of the tiles are formalizations of shapes found in nature 
To the trained eye, this is a garden with trees, flowers, leaves. Under Muslim law, no living creature may be portrayed, least of all the human figure. In the old days, my sketches would have been considered a sacrilege, except that, as an infidel, I'd be expected to know no better. It's godly to be tolerant of strangers. The marketplace serves not only as a commercial outlet, but also as information exchange, peripatetic newsroom, meeting place, an opportunity for the introduction of new ideas. The culinary traditions of Morocco draw on the cultures of the Middle East, using its spice cupboard, combining exotic flavors with the more familiar herbs of the Mediterranean littoral. A pharmacopoeia of medicinal leaves is available. Every ill known to man can be soothed with an infusion of the right stuff. You just have to know your way around nature's laboratory. The green powder is henna, a lady's cosmetic used to color hair and beautify hands and feet. Lavender, rose petals, and all the spices of the East for flavoring, preserving, scenting a room. You can ask the merchant for advice. Here, where the northern shores of Africa meet the southern shores of Europe, the harbor citadel serves as gatekeeper to the Mediterranean, toll gate to the Atlantic. A one-time pirate's lair, raffish, multilingual and many-layered, Muslim trades with Jew and Jew with Christian. Ladies go veiled in public. After the market, something delicious to fortify the traders and their customers. Although all respectable Moroccan ladies go straight home to bake the midday bread. Lamb's knuckles, a lovely stew. Street food, market snacks, provide the visitor with a chance to sample local culinary skills for a very small outlay. Freshly prepared and delicious. These fritters are a sophisticated little treat. Fresh anchovies, neatly deboned, opened out in a butterfly shape, and sandwiched in pairs with a stuffing of shamula, our old favorite, then floured and fried to order. Delicious, cheap, and easy to prepare at home. The sardines are wrapped in recycled computer paper. Rather a good use for it. This vast open air restaurant starts up at sunset. Cloves and cinnamon, honey, maybe a hint of grains of paradise. I have a feeling this spicy drink is an aphrodisiac. Heaven knows what might happen. That aphrodisiac has gone straight to my hands. The delicate tracery is applied with a fine syringe filled with henna paste. This is set to be a seductive masterpiece. It takes six hours for the henna to dry on the skin and you can't use your hands while it dries. Mine's not nearly as good as hers. I didn't leave it on for long enough. We Westerners are too busy. Beauty takes time as does the preparation of the ritual mint tea which honors the visitor. The inclusion of green tea with the mint is relatively modern, dating back to the early 1800s 
when supplies came in from China. The best mint for the job is spearmint, which grows wild in every ditch, but other varieties will do. The tea has to be really well sugared, so that our encounter may be all the sweeter. All Arab nations love sweet things. The pouring of the tea from a height is part of the ritual done to aerate the brew and bring out the flavour. Deliciously refreshing like sucking a mint humbug. <laughs> Clean, fresh spring water, whether for mint tea or cooking, or the ritual hand washing before meals, is not easily come by. Here, a wellspring supplies the villagers. It's the job of the children to fill the plastic containers, load the donkeys, and take the water back up the hill, passing through the cemetery on the way back and forth. A salutary reminder that this, the most important of all commodities, makes the difference between life and death. Five thousand years of civilization formed a common cultural heritage, and as the main provider of sustenance, the Mediterranean played a vital part in the development of the Western world. In prayer, as well as at table, the nations who inhabit its shores cut their cloak from the same cloth. It would be impossible to disentangle the philosophical threads which bind Jew to Christian to Muslim. They crop the same harvest, dip their pitchers in the same wellsprings, trawl the same seas. Long may the sailor return safely home from the sea.